Hello and welcome to the eighth of the Asian Development Bank 3IE Impact Evaluation Video Lecture Series. I'm going to be talking to you today about assessing impact of humanitarian relief assistance and how it can be an opportunity as well as a challenge. In an evaluation, one of the most important things that you can say is that the program caused some percentage change in the outcome of the included population. But really the most important verb in this statement is the verb caused. If you can make that statement with high amount of credibility and authority while using the verb caused, you're essentially there. But doing an impact evaluation usually requires the use of comparison groups. If you want to talk more about or hear more about impact evaluations and comparison groups, please refer back to our lectures in the first part of this series. But I'm going to assume that you know what these are already. The important part about comparison groups is that you can't just have one of them. And you require comparison groups and project groups to be there, but you require a lot of sample points or data points in each one of these two groups. So you need more than one observation so that you can reduce bias in your estimates. In humanitarian assistance, we know while keeping this in mind, that there is a huge gap between what has been provided traditionally by donors for humanitarian assistance and what is available. So, in the humanitarian effectiveness review that was undertaken by DFID in 2011, we found that there was a shortfall of almost $3.4 billion. This means that it becomes even more important to understand as to which programs work, why, under what circumstances, and how much. Let's look now at some of the questions that impact evaluations can help to answer, especially in humanitarian contexts, and how these may be important for pro program managers as well as planners. The first question that impact evaluations can help to answer are about the magnitude of change. So how much were people better off by? For how long were they better off? They can also help to answer questions about implementation design. What amount of assistance and with what frequency should it be delivered so that the best outcome can be achieved? They can also help to answer questions about how best to deliver so that specific outcomes are achieved. So if, for example, you're looking at nutrition outcomes, you may want to answer the question as to whether cash transfers are more effective or vouchers are more effective. Again, impact evaluations can help you answer those questions. Impact evaluations can also answer the question of contribution. So if, for example, there is a multiplicity of actors that are working in a specific area, we can help to answer the question of what effect did all of those actors in a group make to the outcomes that they wanted to achieve. Impact evaluations can also help to answer the cost effectiveness questions. So is it better to deliver education programs that aim to increase education attendance as well as literacy in the form of scholarships or in the form of cash transfers or something else? So enabling that cost effectiveness comparison is also made possible by, by impact valuations. Last but not least, they also help to answer questions about which subgroups were made better off and subgroups were not provided the benefit that they required because of humanitarian emergencies. So the first result that we get from this is that impact evaluations can helpfully supplement already going on evaluation efforts in these contexts and can helpfully answer questions about program design, planning, and strategy. But we also know that impact evaluations can be difficult in humanitarian contexts. This is because there is the need for speed. Impact evaluations are taking place in a context where humanitarian agencies are working at a very fast and rapid pace to then impact their programming and their portfolio choices, it becomes even more important for impact evaluations to deliver these results in a very quick way. Impact evaluations also cannot be planned, unlike impact evaluations in development circumstances. So it's very hard to plan for data collection. 
So they're really constrained by imperfect or absent data. Impact evaluations are also being undertaken in a context which are fairly complex where there is a multiplicity of actors. So if impact evaluations require increased coordination and a change in the way programs are rolled out, this can be another constraint. There is also a high correlation between those groups that do not get humanitarian assistance immediately and groups that are otherwise also vulnerable. This is the problem of high core variability and how this impacts impact valuations is that you're not able to find comparison groups that can be compared to treatment groups. Last but not least is the question of ethics. The ethical problem is as follows. In impact valuations, we require comparison groups and this in many circumstances means that you have to deny the population or the subpopulations in these groups the intervention that you're testing the impact of. I'm going to give you an example of how a lot of these problems may be dealt with, but if you want more information, please also refer to our 3IE's paper on the methods that can be used in impact evaluations in humanitarian assistance. The result here is that impact evaluations require capacity and effort, but can help to remove biases in measurement. Now let's take stock of the impact evaluations that have been undertaken so far. And I'm talking about this because it helps to underscore the need for greater impact evaluations in a field where we have seen more than $90 billion of investment since 2005. We found in a study that was supported by UK Aid as well as USAID that only 39 impact evaluations had been undertaken. Of these, 29 had a theory of change. This, as you would recognize, is an important deficiency. We also looked at these studies to then understand the quality of their, of their work and their analysis. And we found that 23 did not have any balanced tests which means that it was hard for us to figure out as to whether the comparison group and the treatment groups were actually comparable. We also found that 29 of these did not have any power analysis, which means that we could not say with a high amount of confidence as to whether the estimates of change that they were concluding from the impact evaluations were well measured. And we also found, regrettably, that only five of them discussed ethical concerns. All of this underscores the need to undertake high quality evaluations in humanitarian assistance. I'm going to now talk about a hypothetical case study. And this is the case of Sri Lanka, where the tsunami took place in 2004. We know that because of the tsunami, there was a huge amount of devastation that was caused and there were a multitude of actors that came in. Let's assume that there were a multitude of actors that were working in southern Vavunia, which is a province in northern Sri Lanka. We also know that many domestic and national agencies helped in this aid effort and this assistance effort. Let's presume that there was an NGO that was working also, along with all of the other international NGOs, in the area of food assistance. We then find that if we want to try and understand the impact of food assistance and specifically ready-to-use supplementary food, which is a study that was actually done in real life by Action Control de Femme in Chad, we find that in this case we would need to undertake a survey of only 300 households to then be able to compare households that only got food distribution and where only a international NGOs were working with those that got ready to use supplementary food that was being distributed by the domestic NGO in Sri Lanka. So what is our big conclusion here? Our conclusion is that yes, we can deal with questions of ethics. The program that I just defined is what is called a factorial design. No one in the eligible population was denied food distribution that was part of the regular food assistance package. Second, we know that the data collection effort was not very large. This is because there was, you were taking advantage of the fact that you could collect data on households and 300 households needed to be surveyed as part of this effort. And the time required to undertake this study is presumably not very long. 
given the experience of Axio Control de Femme in Chad, where this study from inception and without much planning at the beginning took about 18 months. So the result from this section is really to say that impact evaluations are possible in humanitarian assistance. It is possible to do them without making recipients worse off. They can help in better planning, and they do not require long periods of time or large data sets. That concludes my lecture. Thank you so much for listening.